So I want to do a quick, quick video, clean up some stuff uh, that I did. Um, the my grandparents' good friend, um, they were the Paris's. Tony's parents. God, I wish I remember. George, I think was his name. George Paris. And uh, Michael and Tony Paris, I can't remember what her name is. My grandma told me a story one time that Tony, man, that, you know, he had that, that flaming Robert Plant hair, man. And just, he's a good looking guy, man. And the women loved him. But um, he had a Harley, man. And he comes, you know, my grandparents lived in a really conservative neighborhood. And he comes driving up, parking his Harley in their driveway, man. And she's like, you know, freaking out, man. I'm going, who's this? And it's, you know, young Tony Paris, you know. And uh, oh, that, that was, uh, you know, the... The couple that sold my, my, or the guy that's, you know, Nick Parrott that uh, sold my dad, or tried to sell my dad life insurance, and we ended up, you know, meeting up back east and, you know, spending time with them. And they took us to the airport up in Canada, because we flew Air Canada when I was 11. We came back, spent time with, you know, family and stuff. And uh, uh, so I just, I kind of wanted to, you know, the Parrots and the Parises. Um Ricardo Bernardo, I didn't, I didn't explain it um, enough, or I didn't explain it. Uh, okay, he bought that that beater car, and and there was a six ounces in there, and then he said it was Jamaican, and I'm going, how do you know it's Jamaican? I never asked him. I never, I mean, I didn't even know about it till after it all happened, and I'm, you know, going. I mean, that's that's what that was all about. How you know, it's six ounces? How do you know it's six? I mean, Jamaican. How do you know it's Jamaican? I mean, come on. Okay, and, and I want to clear up a couple things with my Uncle Dick. This is, this, it didn't make me mad, but this is kind of like, you know, dude, um, I, I was, you know, um, riding my bike between jobs, I think, one day, and, and he was sitting outside this restaurant, um, had just come from eating lunch, and I'm going, well, why didn't you take me to lunch? But and no, that's not the point, but no, he just come from an AA meeting, and, and then eating lunch with the, the people that he went to meetings with, and I'm, yeah, I'd always go, on, you know, Dick, why didn't you, in that whole summer, you know, you could have exposed me to AA. You could have, I mean, it was so traumatic. Mine went to my first AA meeting. You know, if Misty hadn't gone with me, I wouldn't have gone. And and it's just kind of like, you know, um, okay, you know, I mean, whatever. He was wrapped up in his own world. He's narcissistic as anybody. Um, another thing, Rich, uh, Dick, it was interesting. Um, he went back to the University of Oregon, got his law degree, and... Uh, my dad was living in Aurora, Colorado, and Dick was like 15 minutes away, and they used to get together for like dinner every Wednesday night, and it was funny, my dad would get mad at his brother, brother Dick, and he, my dad made, when I was growing up, my dad made bread every Sunday, man, he just, he experimented, he did things, you know, and, you know, he'd get mad at, at, at brother Dick, and he'd go, I ain't giving him any bread this week, you know, that was funny, um, but um, they, they, Dick didn't show up for their Wednesday dinner, and so the next day, my dad's concerned. And he goes over his apartment and gets the manager, and they go in his, his apartment. And Dick is uh, slouched over the back of his couch, still breathing, had had a massive, massive stroke. Um, you know, he was way overweight. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. Um, one of the things Rich told me was that, you know, Dick was a financial wizard with, like, um, um, Anchorage office supply money, man. He could, he could you know just work magic with their money and make it, you know, there's an art to that. And his personal life was just, just one big mess. You know, there were uncashed checks. Um, you know, uh, he, they got him to the hospital and he died like, you know, later. Um, and that poor guy, man, he sat there for, you know, 18 hours, you know, 12 hours, however long, man, an hour, a minute would be too long laying like that. Jeez, man. Hope he wasn't conscious. Um, I won't start crying. But when when I was sitting in the back of that bench in that in that Catholic church, um, St. Joseph's here in in Squim, and I I was bawling my eyes out. It wasn't just that Elena was sitting on John's knee. It was the fact. I mean, what really set me off. This, this was as equally as impactful to me was that when. When his nephew spoke, and, and I mean, I, and I'd seen John, man. I'd known him for seven months, you know, so I'd, I'd seen him in action. I, I, you know, I watch people, man. I see what you do, man. I see what you say, and I see what, if it compares to what you do. And, uh, you know, when he said that he loved everybody, man, it hit me that John loved me, man. And, and I, think, I think I had a special place in his heart, man, but he loved me, man. And that just, I'm going to start crying again. Man, that, that, was, that was powerful. Became the glazed donut monster. I don't know what I heard that on, man. Uh, 
Ah, real monsters or something when my kids are watching, you know, cartoons and when they were kids, man. I loved Ah, real monsters. I loved a lot of their cartoons. Um, anyway, so that I just I just wanted to share that, man. It wasn't just Elena sitting on his knee, man. It was the fact that John loved me. Kind of puts an, an onus on me that you know to go out and act like that, you know, be, be talking about it so much. Okay, my Jim and Josephine McKay, this old Irish couple. Um, you know, I mean, they did travel the world. I mean, I, I forgot they went to Asia, you know, they went to Africa. They, I mean, they were all over the world and they didn't ever have any kids. I, I thought that was, you know, who knows? I mean, I never asked why. Um, but it was funny cause I, I had, he got this stroke and I guess he just got really just, you know, like just being an, an it, it, it became hard to take care of him. And, you know, Josephine was telling me before the, the stroke that he used to be really loving and caring and gentle and, you know, just, I mean, he was, like I said, 210 pounds and she's like this little 90 pound, you know, nothing. And uh, it, it was funny because, I mean, they were, when I started there, you know, and took the first shift, I mean, they were mad at each other because she had called him an old Irish bastard like a year and a half before and he was still pissed, man. I mean, they were fighting one time or something. He's like... You know, I'm there. I mean, it's you're, you're they're fighting in front of you, and, and you know he's like having to justify himself to me or something. He turns to me and 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 she, he goes, "Man, she called me an Irish bastard or how long ago?" And I, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, "Well, you are, you are an old Irish bastard." I mean, I would never say that. But, uh, that I just that was you know kind of like a, one of the highlights of my Jim and Josephine McKay. You know, they, you know, Jim McKay. You know. Agony of Defeat, that was, you know, the same name. Um, okay, got the mailman turned around behind me. Um, back in the, I want to say in the late 80s, because um, the group of guys I was hanging out with in AA, Stan, um, he was our psychology buddy. Um, he was the one that said that, that your inner child was just something that somebody wrote down on a, a paper one day and all of a sudden it becomes this, you know, scientific thing and it's not, you know, but anyway, um, he got, he got tickets to, uh, to go see, uh, Dallas at the Raiders, the Cowboys at the Raiders. And they were great seats, man. They, I, we were like 20 rows up right behind the Raider bench, 40 yard line, you know, um, the left side of the, of the, their, their yard markage. And, and it was great because, Magic Johnson was, you know, there was a bunch of celebrities, but Magic Johnson was down there, you know, on the sideline, you know, sideline pass. And um, Jay Cutler, I think, was the quarterback for the, what was it, Jay something uh, for the Raiders. And, I mean, he wasn't doing really good. And all of us are chanting, put Magic in, put Magic in. I mean, and Magic's turned around going, no, 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 no. Shh, shh, shh. And, and it was great, man. Um, so we go to this game, and Jerry Jones had just bought the Cowboys, you know, recently before that. And, I, I think Al Davis was just like, you know, hey, you upstart owner, you know, you come into my house, I'm going to show you what, you know, I'm going to show you a halftime, you know, show. And so they had a fireworks show at, at halftime. And I, I swear to God, it was the, the actual show itself was better than any grand finale I've ever seen in a fireworks show. It, I mean, just the, in the grand finale was just and, you know, Al Day was just going, you know, <laughs> hell with you, Jerry Jones. Um, so, I mean, I compare two things in my life to that. When when Madeline brought me back after my fasting, you know, that that's what she did. It was just like that grand finale at that Raider game, man. Just, that's what the spark of life brought, she brought back to me. It was just like that. And the other thing is... Oh, Madeline brought me back. The fireworks. My story, you know, I'm, I'm telling my story here, you know, not... I'm not gonna adhere to a timeline, you know, but, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. The grand finality of the Raider Dallas, you know, halftime show is coming. It, I haven't even touched on the surface of, you know, my story. Anyway, many blessings to you all.